Hello and welcome to the Seascent journey with me, Ryan. In this section, we're going to pick up the second part of physical components, primarily focused around the cabling element. In our previous section, we touched base on understanding the key network and infrastructure components. For those who don't know, you can contact me here on YouTube, on LinkedIn, or Twitter. Okay, so first let's have a discussion around copper and fiber, the differences between them and understand some of the reasons why we might want to use one over the other. First, let's talk about copper. Copper itself uses the electrical signals to communicate with one another. So if we imagine that we have two PCs, these electrical signals will be interpreted by both the layer one, which is the physical, and layer two, which is the data link, in the OSI Open System Interconnect model. And essentially between these two devices they were able to determine that if there was an increase in voltage that may specify a 1 in binary and if there's a decrease in voltage it would be able to identify it as a 0 in binary. If there is a higher than normal uh, voltage on the wire then they could indicate that there was some sort of collision and they do that using the carrier sense multi-access with collision detection and that's a protocol that's used at Ethernet at layer 2 and we will understand that in more detail in the videos to come. We know that it's affected by interference. So if you had a electrical source and you had to run some copper cabling beside it, there's a good chance that that interference is going to scramble the information inside. And because the voltage levels are used to indicate the binary information on the wire, that could corrupt the actual signals themselves and when the data link layer actually goes through the CRC check the redundancy check of the actual message itself it will show up as corrupt and therefore will have to be retransmitted or dropped. It's cheap so copper itself you can pick up your copper cabling primarily known as Ethernet which is the twisted pair type of cabling very cheap at a local store and it's easy to create with copper cabling depending on the length of cable you require or the type of cable whether that's the different types of cables like uh, rolled cables or maybe the uh, crossover cables and straight through cables you can actually cut the ends of the cable off turn the pairs into the correct way to change the type of cable you can also cut the cable in half if you want a short cable or buy a long reel of cable and create your own ones essentially. It's a much easier way of doing it. And comparing that with fiber, the transmission is via light. Now that's either LED or laser depending on the type of fiber that you've purchased. The light is a, it's a bright light that look actually shines out of the end of the cable so uh, don't look down it. It will damage your eyes. There's no interference so if there was any electrical sources that we had to run our cable near then let's use fiber yeah because we don't want those uh, external interference to impact the integrity of our data and the distance copper cabling depending on the type of cable tend to go up to 100 meters or so with fiber in go much further we have two different types of fiber we have something called uh, multi-mode and single mode in the multi-mode fiber, it's actually basically like this. You have your uh, fiber itself, and a line, a uh, light, sorry, will come into the fiber, normally an LED with multi-mode, and it will bounce off the edges. It's normally also a um, a low-level LED using uh, plastic in the actual cable itself. Single mode. It's actually glass and inside the single mode there's actually a single there's a single light essentially and that's not bounced off the side with single mode you can get up to about 10,000 meters and it, like I said it uses the lasers and the glass whereas the multi mode can go about 2,000 meters and it uses LED and it's plastic and it's more secure more secure meaning it's harder to tap with your copper cabling, it's relatively easy 
to actually interpret those voltages and in turn replicate some of that information that's being sent to another host. Okay, so now we know the differences between the fiber and copper cabling. Let's jump into copper cables. There's three types I want to discuss. The first being the coaxial cable or coax, and that's a thick cable shown at the top. Now this cable itself comes in a few forms. The two that you're probably going to hear is the RG6 I think it is, which is used in televisions and high speed internet basically. And we also have the RG59 which is primarily used for patch panels. Now we can see from the actual picture itself there's a thick very thick plastic jacket that goes around the outside of the actual cable then you have this metal shielding insulation or insulator and then the actual copper itself now this type of cabling was used in the old uh, Tempace 5 and 10 base 2 which is uh, primarily known as thick net and something else called thin net and this would be a kind of a bus like topology where you would have a single cable and off the back of this cable they would have something called vampire taps and these vampire taps are essentially a teeth if you like and they would pierce a hole in the actual wire itself and uh, expose the copper inside and essentially off the back of that they could actually install a host and again they would clamp down on that and install a host and this would be the old way of essentially configuring a ethernet network because ethernet would run through this copper or this coax cable and, and the ethernet would be the layer 2 protocol used Nowadays, we don't use um, the bus topology like this. We actually use a star where we have everything connected into a centralized device, and that's normally a switch. And we also don't use the coax cables. We actually use something called twisted pair cables, which we'll come to in a moment. Second cable I want to talk about is the RJ11 cables. RJ11 cables, this guy over here, which is the known as your telephone cables. Uh, you may notice the end, it's a very small end and it's actually inside this cable we've got two bits of copper that just run either side and it would extend the uh, NTE, the network termination which is inside the premises kind of you have your your box from your provider and you would have out the side of that the RJ11 cable and that RJ11 cable will sometimes go into your home router, for example, if you had a AD, an ADSL technology. Moving on from this, we then have what we use nowadays, essentially, in, mo uh, in most of the uh, copper insulation. And the one that you're familiar with now is the twisted pair. And the twisted pair comes in two forms, shielded and unshielded. Now, the shielded pair itself is shown on the bottom there. This is the unshielded and this is the shielded. You can see there's an, a little bit of shield in there, some aluminium essentially, and that would keep any or attempt to keep any electrical signals from interfering with it. Now inside, as you can probably see better on this picture, the actual cable in itself is twisted. So you'd have multiple pairs, in fact there's uh, eight cables, four pairs, and the pairs themselves are actually twisted around each other, like so and then actually in the cable all those pairs are then twisted together as well so you have this this twisted uh, mesh inside the cable if you like and the reason they do that is because let's say we have our cable and there is some kind of electrical interference what happens is the twist inside always ensures that there's some copper pulling away from this electrical interference and in turn it does less damage to the data inside and this twisting happens on both the unshielded and the shielded. The only difference with the shielded is this extra protection here. 
nine out of ten times is actually the unshielded that you use in the premises and most likely in your offices because of the cost it tends to cost a lot more for the shielded version of this type of cable I've also put some comments here regarding RJ45 and Ethernet now the comments I want to make around that is RJ45 just like RJ11 is actually the head that goes on the end of it the RJ45 head looks very similar to the RJ11 the main difference being it's a little bit bigger the Ethernet element the reason I've picked that up is because it's important at this level that we understand the differences just briefly anyway the differences between Ethernet and copper now this type of cable here is very well known as an Ethernet cable and the reason it's called an Ethernet cable is because 90, 99% of the time is carrying a layer 2 technology called Ethernet and that's where it gets its name as an Ethernet cable but what's important distinction here is it's a twisted pair cable that happens to be running the Ethernet at layer 2 and that's where it gets its name as an Ethernet cable okay so when we get later on and we look at this OSI model the open system interconnect model and we start to understand the differences between physical data link network and so forth we can then start putting together where these technologies actually separate because there are overlaps like for example here this is a copper cabling but we call it Ethernet moving on let's have a discussion around the different types of fiber cables that we have at our disposal now we know the differences between copper and fiber and why you might use one over the other but I just want to touch base on the different types of fiber cables we have first of all we have something called a straight tip the straight tip cable obviously gets its name because of this <laughs> it's actually straight on the end and it has uh, a bayonet sort of uh, screw top here which essentially you would connect it in and then turn it to lock it further to this we have what's called a field assembly connector or sometimes referred to as a ferrule connector and this type of end is a screw on so you would actually plug it into the connector and screw it around it's probably the most secure way of actually ensuring that the fibers in the port and depending on like the environment maybe like an industrial environment there tend to be the the go-to connectors for those we then have something called a square connector or a subscriber connector and that's this guy um, just down the bottom there just here and then we also have last but not least the guy just above him which is the little connector or lucent connector now as you can see for example with these guys there's actually two parts of the cable one send one's receive and you can actually unclip these and make them essentially or flip them around so you'd have uh, send and send and receive and receive to make some sort of uh, essentially a straight through connector and then you could flip them around so you'd have send at one and receive at the other to make what's called a crossover cable and the different types of cable will be used in different environments depending on why you need each cable now we've seen the different types of fibers how they actually connect into the device varies the most common type of connectors really are the LC the little connectors and they use something called an SFP so that's a small form factor pluggable and that's this guy up here and essentially this small form factor pluggable will plug or essentially go into the device and then this actual connection here would then slide into the SFP now it's important that when you get uh, an SFP that it's the correct SFP because obviously as you can tell just looking at this slide here's just just four of the fiber connectors and there's there's many more <clears throat> you need to make sure that it's not only the correct physical appearance meaning is it an SC or an LC but you also need to make sure whether it's multimodal single mode the thing that we discussed uh, previously what I've gone ahead and done is took a photo of a Cisco switch that I have in my house and this is a Meraki uh, networking switch or a cloud based switch they like to call it and essentially you can see here that there are two SFP ports this particular guy here would just slot into this particular Cisco and then I'm able to attach this cable into this SFP slot now with the Meraki itself 
it requires specific SFPs. I can't just go buy one off the shelf and plug it in. So that's another thing you need to put into consideration. And to the left of that, we have all of these connectors. And these connectors are just standard home uh, twisted pair, copper twisted pair cabling. And of course, they're running the layer two protocol ethernet. In our next section, I just want to whiteboard two use case scenarios around how we can use the right cable for the right job. The first one is going to be around a DSL technology example and the second one will be around a campus network design. So first, if we can imagine that we have our central office, central office or exchange out into maybe the town centre and from there you have maybe a overhead cable with a few drop points in between that eventually make its way back to your house. When that cable comes into the house itself it connects into what's called an NTE and that NTE itself just like this will have a RJ11 cable come out of it. Now normally the supplier gives you a 1 or 3 meter cable and that 1 or 3 meter cable sometimes goes into what's referred to as a splitter or a filter which then you have maybe your telephone off the back of it and yeah that's a terrible telephone or it sometimes go directly in to your hardware so let's say we have a router here now these sockets here get sometimes installed in the wrong room or they get installed somewhere really odd uh, maybe like the attic or the loft for example now a lot of people what they tend to do is install another one of these in the house or what they do is this cable they go off to the shop and they buy a 10 meter or 20 meter cable and then what happens is from that actual main socket they have a very long RJ11 cable and at the end of that they then install their router the problem with this is this particular RJ11 cable as we know has just two bits of copper in it and this copper is not twisted or not doing anything special to help with any cable resistance or help with external interference so essentially what happens is this poor cable here being designed for telephone and not really extending your router starts to degrade the overall service and from the actual exchange perspective when it runs its dynamic testing to identify the length and quality of the cable it starts to notice that actually when it does a synchronization check with the actual router the router seems further than what it should be or maybe the router itself seems to be on a poor line and as such you'll see the speeds degrade. Now that's a good example of using the wrong cable for the wrong job. What we should have done is actually left the router where it was using this one or three meter cable and then from the router have the correct cable in this case RJ45 or as we discussed twisted copper pairs if I actually wrote RJ45 correctly <laughs> and then on the back of this RJ45 cable we'd have our devices connected may that be a PC or it could be connected to a switch in another room which then our devices connect to. This correct use of cabling will actually ensure that the exchange itself will see the correct length of cabling and the correct quality of cabling therefore giving us the speed that we require and this cable itself as we discuss can go up to 100 meters so you have that extension around the premises and that's a home where or home premises example of using the correct cable for the right job. Now let's grow on this and have a look at a campus design. Now what I mean by campus design is campuses are normally designed on two or three layer structures so let me draw one for you. Let's say we have two switches and the back of these switches we've got a bunch of actual PCs connecting into them. Normally these switches will have a uplink and that uplink is normally a resilient uplink like so into another layer of switches this known as the distribution and this known as the access 
Now this ac access and distribution, depending on the size of the campus, could actually all live in one very big cabinet. However, depending on whether it's a collapsed core or whether it has an actual three-tier hierarchical design with a core elsewhere, your core is normally located further away from this kind of physical rack. Now if that was the case and the core was located more than let's say 100 meters away then we need to have a think about what sort of cable we should be using there because we know that copper cabling at least without any repeaters or devices in the middle can only travel so far so we may need to think about using a fiber connection there maybe utilizing the multi mode with the LEDs and ensuring that we have the SFP modules at both ends and actually utilizing fiber instead of copper. And that's another use case of using the right cable for the right job but in a campus design instead of a home environment. Okay so that's all we've got time for this lesson. Let's wrap up what we've actually learned. We've first touched base on the differences between copper and fiber. We know that copper is prone to interference and fiber is not. Fiber is more secure than copper. We then went into the different types of copper. Understanding what's twisted pair and RJ11 coax cables. We touched base on the old way of Ethernet and how it used to work in 10 base 5 and 10 base 2. We then went straight into fiber, connection, fiber connections and fiber cables, understanding what's straight tip and square connector and ferrule connectors, and ultimately what's required to connect those devices up using the um, small form factor pluggables, the SFPs. And then we had a quick whiteboard discussion around using the right cable for the right job, looking at a home. DSL connectivity and actually a campus hierarchical design. I hope this video has been informative and I'd like to thank you for viewing and if it has been please do like and subscribe.